Hello students, in this video we will discuss about the design of switch capacitor circuit. So I am going to break down this discussion into three parts. So during the first part we will tr I will try to discuss about the overview of the circuit and then I will also try to discuss about the sampling phase which is one of the mode of operation of your switch capacitor circuit. And during the second phase, I will try to discuss about the hold phase, which is again one of the mode of its operation. And we will also try to address some of the issues that this hold phase has with it. And during the third part, I will be discussing about some of the applications of the switch capacitor circuit, namely the switch capacitor amplifier and then the switch capacitor circuit. As an add-on, we will also try to combine these two circuits and then we will try to build what is known as a switch capacitor filter which is again a design and this will not be discussed during this particular video but it will be covered during the class. So in order to know the need for the switch capacitor circuit let us take an example and then try to identify where exactly the switch capacitor would be utilized. So I am going to take a simple mixed signal IC design uh, as it shown here the mic basically picks an analog signal which is basically continuous in time and continuous in amplitude and that would be actually converted into a digital signal by passing through an analog to digital converter and the output of this ADC in general would be discrete in time and discrete in amplitude and once this is converted it would be processed through some digital signal processor and then it comes out again in terms of dis discrete in time and discrete in amplitude signal form. So again in order to uh, reproduce an analog signal it has to be processed through what is known as a digital to analog converter. So this is a basic block diagram and we still have to figure out where exactly the switch capacitor circuit can be utilized in this particular blocks. So now what I am going to do is I am going to show that this uh, switch capacitor circuit is basically utilized in this particular block and let us see what is the need for this switch capacitor to be used in this ADC block diagram. So this particular circuit shows the internal block diagram of an ADC. As shown before, uh, the ADC basically performs the conversion of your continuous time and continuous amplitude signal to what is known as a dis discrete in time and discrete in amplitude signal. Right. So in between this conversion, we have a sampler which basically converts your continuous time and continuous amplitude signal into something known as a discrete in time but continuous in amplitude. And later on, this is again passed through a quantizer which does the remaining job trying to throw an output which is basically discrete in time as well as discrete in amplitude. Now the question is where exactly my switch capacitor would fit in. So it is basically in the sampler circuit that we are going to use the switch capacitor circuit. So the diagram that is shown here basically represents a simple sampling circuit. So there is a switch and this switch when it is closed it basically samples the incoming V in the value of the input V in is basically copied onto this capacitor right and when the switch is open what happens is this capacitor will try to hold the value that was previously sampled. So we basically end up having two modes of operation. The one is the sampling mode and this is the mode when the switch let me label this one with phi. So when phi is closed okay, and it gets into hold mode when the phi is opened. The next important thing that we have to do is the realization of this particular switch with an actual device. So we basically use four different type of devices to realize this particular switch. So they are the NMOS transistor, the PMOS transistor and then the transmission gate and followed by that we will talk about the bootstrap circuit. Okay, So we will just try to realize the switch with each of these uh, transistors or each of these circuits and later we will try to 
see what are the drawbacks in each of these uh, circuits in order to realize that particular switch and we will try to rectify as we move along this particular path. Okay, as shown in this figure, I have replaced the switch with an NMOS transistor, right? So now when the clock is high, we basically know that this NMOS creates a channel or the NMOS basically becomes on and I can sample whatever the VIN that I have onto this capacitor CH. Now, when this particular transistor that is turned on, it also poses some kind of resistance and we know the resistance or the channel resistance could be modeled with this particular expression which is defined as something like 1 upon mu n COX W by L times that of VGS minus VT. Right? So now the only thing that we have to look for it is basically what is the value of VGS that I have currently. Now what I know is this particular switch has its source terminal that is pointing here and it and we know that this MOS transistor can have its source and drain terminal interchangeable right so we are not really worried about uh, where exactly my source terminal is pointing but the other way around is when I try to sample we know that during the sampling phase the capacitor tries to hold the same value that I have at the input right so we basically have somewhere the value of the source that is closer to the value of VIN that I have at the drain or you can even assume that this particular node is my source and then we can have the discussion so there is nothing trouble in having the source and drain being interchanged but still I can have my source terminal being considered to be at VIN and we know that the value of VGS is actually switched from 0 to 1 and let us assume that this one value is represented by the supply voltage which is equal to VDD so in a way I have this VGS expression which is defined as VG minus VS and the VG is right now at VDD you know when the clock is high so I substitute that value and the source terminal is basically is equal to my VN and now this is the value of VGS that I have and that when I plug in here that this expression is basically a function of VN now let us see how does this impact uh, the R on resistance by looking at a graph that has been plotted R on versus the VN we start by plotting the value of R on with VN that starts with the value of 0 Okay, so when I have a VIN that is equal to 0, then we have this VGS that is equal to the value of VDD and due to which the resistance posed by this R on would be pretty small, right? So let us assume that it has an R on that is equal to a value that is marked here, okay? As we keep on increasing the value of VIN, then this particular term becomes quite smaller and smaller and due to which the resistance of my channel would actually grows up so it goes something like this and when the value of this V in goes all the way closer to a value that is equal to VDD minus the threshold of my device then obviously this entire term would go to zero and due to which the impedance of this goes to infinity so it is something like this is what the plot we would get so because of this R on that is not being constant it poses some some of the issues when we try to realize the switch with an NMOS transistor. So let us look at those drawbacks that happens just because of this the R on being a function of our input. So as shown here the bandwidth of the circuit basically limits. So now why does this bandwidth comes as a limitation is basically we know that this transistor has some resistance and this is nothing but we can model this entire transistor structure with a kind of resistance which is the R on that we have shown in the previous slide and we have something like a circuit which has some in V in and it has some V out right so this circuit is nothing but it's a simple low pass filter circuit and as the value of this R on becomes larger then what would happen is like the bandwidth actually gets reduced okay and again the bandwidth also depends on the value of the CH that I have and we so in order to hold the value for a longer time we generally tend to have this capacitance 
which is quite larger but this in turn limits the bandwidth as we know that the bandwidth is basically returned as something like 1 by RC right so so as I increase the value of this R or I increase the value of this capacitor for different reasons what happens is like the bandwidth of the circuit gets limited so one of the reason where we want this R on uh, to be uh, high is basically we want this switch to be as small as possible so which means that the W by L factor that I have here if it is quite smaller then we know that the expression for R on is basically defined as something like um, mu n C O X W by L right so when this quantity becomes smaller then in turn it creates a larger R on and due to which the bandwidth of the circuit gets limited now let us look into the second drawback which is basically the dependency of this R on on the value of V in actually creates a nonlinear relation between the R on and the V in and due to which this nonlinear relation creates what is known as an amplitude distortion while processing the input signal and the third one is basically the KT by C noise which is the thermal noise that is induced just because of the channel resistance so these are some of the drawbacks that are related to NMOS and we can also correlate these drawbacks with respect to PMOS as well. But before I correlate we will just try to find how uh, the expression for R on and let us try to plot how the value of R on depends on the V in for a PMOS device. So as shown here the circuit is being replaced with a PMOS transistor and in order to turn on this device we basically have to have a zero across its gate potential such that the device turns on and then the V in is sampled onto the hold capacitor. So once this is on now let us try to express the channel resistance by having the expression as something like 1 upon mu P COX W by L of this transistor into VSG minus VDP so now let us try to find what is this value of VSG that we have so we know that the source potential is basically connected to the value of V in and I have this VS minus VG and this VS is right now at a value of V in and whereas the voltage that is available across the gate is basically the zero in order to turn on this device right so I just plug in this value and then when we try to plot here or when I try to re-express this expression it turns out to be something like W by L times that of Vn minus of the modulus of VTP so now when we try to plot this expression as a function of this Vn what we would get is something as a kind of kara which is exactly opposite to the carrot that we have got when we try to plot the channel resistance of a NMOS. So now uh, as we know that when the value of Vn is less than Vt then obviously the transit is off and uh, due to which we have a larger impedance and this impedance is basically when there is no channel at all right and after a while once the value of Vn gets closer to the value of Vn then the channel starts creating and then uh, due to which the channel resistance keeps steps down okay and this is what has been reflected onto this graph so the major problem that we encounter in either with a PMOS transistor or an NMOS transistor being realized as a switch is that the change in the value of this R on and then the induction of this change as a kind of amplitude distortion on the hold capacitor so the way that we can uh, remove this uh, amplitude distortion is by um, making this R on that is completely independent of this Vn right so that is how we can ultimately eliminate this amplitude distortion which is which is one of the um, the most troublesome drawback so I have to make sure that in order to make the switch to be on I need to apply the appropriate gate potentials across both the PMOS as well as the NMOS a zero in order to turn on this uh, device and the gate of this NMOS with some VDD okay so these are the gate potentials that I am applying in order to make 
the entire transmission gate to turn on right so under this condition we need to see what is the channel resistance and is this channel resistance is independent of the v in or not right so i will try to express the entire channel resistance as the channel resistance of the nmos in parallel with the channel resistance of the pmos device and i'm just going to plug in all of those uh, expressions that we have derived before which is nothing but kn dash w by l of the nmos device and we have this gate that is connected to vdd minus the v in which is nothing but the source potential minus the vtn and that goes in parallel with this uh, kp dash which is the pmos device and then v in minus vtp right so once you so try to solve all of these things, uh, you would end up having an expression which is uh, something like KN dash W by L of N and then VDD minus VTN. And then I have tried to take out the terms that are common uh, or that are related to VN, right? So I'll just put it something like this. So I have removed those terms which are common uh, with, with the terms that are related to V in from both these uh, expressions and then I have re-expressed this as a second term here and followed by this still we have this VTP so that I have to plug in and I am just continuing the same expression which is at the denominator. Yeah. So if I could able to somehow make this expression to be equal to 0 then the expression that I would end up having would be completely independent of this V in term. So this complete expression seeing, uh, shows us that there is no dependency of this V in. The moment I try to place the, the PMOS transistor in parallel with NMOS transistor trying to create what is known as a transmission gate. So the same is being uh, rewritten here and when you try to plot this as a function of uh, R on versus the V in, uh, this is the resistance posed by the NMOS transistor and this is the resistance posed by the PMOS transistor and when you put them in parallel, you effectively end up having almost a constant R on value. Okay, so the value is not much changing as we had before. Okay. Yeah, so now, uh, as I said before, we'll just look into the uh, drawbacks of the of this transmission gate being utilized as a switch. So one of the major drawback is there's a supply voltage that is required in order to turn on both the device is basically has to be more than the threshold voltage of a PMOS plus the threshold voltage of an NMOS transistor. So what I really mean here is that uh, this requirement in general poses a kind of constraint that cannot be used for a low power application or something when you want to use this as a kind of sampling circuit in a mobile device then this transmission gate might not be a proper choice for us to substitute as a switch. The other drawback that we have is that realizing this term or realizing this KN dash W by L of n mos to be equal to the uh, kp dash w by l of p mos is basically harder in order to remove the dependency of this v in term right so so again realizing because each of these parameters depends on something like mu n and we, these are sensitive to temperature as well as the uh, process parameters so in general while realizing in an ic it becomes quite harder for us to equate both these values okay and that is uh, one of the other major drawback that we have in the transmission gate so the way by which we can address these issues is that i i still have to rely on a single transistor not just having two transistors so that is one of the uh, takeaway point okay just because when i use two two transistors which are uh, one as pmos the other one as uh, nmos then these two requirements poses this kind of uh, issues so the way to counteract these problem is by having a switch that is basically built by making use of a single transistor so that i no need to satisfy this requirement nor this requirement
So let us look at a circuit which is known as bootstrap circuit which will actually try to utilize a single transistor that tries to uh, remove the dependency of R on on the value of Vn. So let me try to draw the circuit of this uh, bootstrap circuit by making use of an NMOS transistor. So basically I need to have an NMOS transistor and that goes and gets connected to CH and the drain is connected to my VN. Yeah. So, so now that when I directly apply the clock signal over to the gate of, of this particular transistor, what happens is this creates what is known as a VDD and whenever the clock turns off, the voltage that I would apply onto this phi signal would be equal to zero. And, and as we know that the moment it is on, we know that the signal value across my source would be equal to Vn. So somehow, uh, when I try to write the value of VGS, the VGS term basically had the, these two quantities and that's how the, uh, the value of VGS has an impact onto this uh, R on expression. So now how can I eliminate the value of this VGS uh, that depends on the value of Vn. So the way to counteract this particular issue is by making sure that the value of the gate potential when it is on it not just to be equal to VDD but I just want something like VDD plus Vn. Right? So if I could able to somehow achieve this as its gate potential then the effective voltage of this VGS would actually eliminate the value of Vn and what I have as a voltage across VGS would be something like so due to which what I do is I try to connect the supply voltage which is VDD okay and then the node value at this particular point would be equal to the Vn that I have plus the potential that I added here so basically effectively what I have here is is a potential that is equal to VDD plus Vn but also uh, I need this device to be turned off right so the other value that I I need to be fed as a phi signal is a ground okay so what I do is I generally have a switch and through the switch when the switch is on then I need to provide the gate potential to be equal to Vd plus this Vdn okay so that could be achieved when this switch is closed so I operate this particular switch by having a signal which is defined as phi1 but the other way is like in order to turn off this particular device or in order to move to the whole phase I need the gate potential to be connected to ground so in order to do so I have to have one more switch and that's been connected the other end of the switch is basically connected to the ground and this has to be operated with a different signal okay so basically what I what I have here is the phi1 and phi2 signal are two non-overlapping signals so when I have such kind of signals then it is possible for me to have the value of VGS to be exactly equal to VDD when the when whenever you have this phi that is equal to VDD plus V in and you can also have the value of VGS that is equal to zero when the phi has to be equal to zero so before we end this part one session let us look at an important trade-off between the speed and the accuracy specification as shown here so we are going to model this the switch capacitor circuit with this RC network and we know that when a step input is applied at the input the output could be modeled with an expression which is defined as V out is equal to the V in that is nothing but the amplitude of input pulse multiplied with this terms so this we already know and we have already discussed during the class right so now out of this the first part which is nothing but we call this term as the forced response and the second part which is nothing but the natural response right so as the time increases the natural response would actually die out and due to this expression 
we have an output plot that grows exponentially and tries to attain the final value as the time progresses. Suppose if I am allowed to have a tolerance value of epsilon with respect to the input and the circuit takes some ts seconds to reach this value which is equal to vn minus epsilon then one can express the time ts from this expression as ts is equal to rc times that of ln of the error value which is vn minus the v out okay so which which can be written as something like this right consider uh, that you are allowed to have an error value of say for example 0.1 percent then this expression which specifies the time required to have an output voltage that is equal to v in minus this epsilon could be approximated to be equal to so thus the value of tc basically defines the minimum clock period for the phi that needs to be high to have an error value which is equal to 0.1 percent so this minimum ts in turn defines the maximum clock frequency that is f max to be defined as one upon twice the value of this ts so as stated before you can see how the requirement of accuracy which is basically this 0.1 percentage in sampling constrains the minimum clock period and in turn the speed at which it can operate at a maximum